Well, hey everybody, what's up? Pastor Matt here. Thanks for checking into the YouTube channel. I guess I'm going to get myself into trouble a little bit here today because we're going to talk about Christian nationalism. What is a Christian nationalist? Is there a fitting and proper definition for this term? And uh, you may be interested to know my opinion whether I would consider myself a Christian nationalist. So let's get into this topic today. You know, I think this term is very much going to be one of those terms that becomes the very war over definitions. Very often, a definition itself, a term, a turn of phrase, uh, an idea, can be very much captured by one side or the other based on who wins the propaganda war of getting the terms to be seen generally by the public in the way that they want to construe that particular term. And I think the term Christian nationalism is going to be discussed more and more and more, especially with the midterm elections coming up. No question about that. If the elections go one way or the other way, I have a feeling that the term Christian nationalist is going to be used to shame and to cajole and to manipulate people on a very widespread uh, basis. And I want you, dear viewer, to have a reasonable definition for what such a term could possibly mean. What is a Christian nationalist? Well, that's the very topic we're going to tackle today. What's up, everybody? Thanks for checking into this channel. My name is Matthew Everhard. I'm the pastor of Gospel Fellowship PCA. We are a Reformed Bible-believing church just north of Pittsburgh. We'd love to have you join us for worship on the Lord's Day at 8.30 or 11. Hey, by the way, got to mention this. I am promoting my new book right now. It's called Souls, How Jesus Saves Sinners. has nothing to do with this particular topic of this video, but it is very much an exposition of the gospel. It's the gospel that saves the soul. Thus the title, Souls, How Jesus Saves Sinners. Look, there's a lot of things you can mess up in this world. You do not want to mess up your understanding of what the gospel is, how Christ came to save us. It's a very clear treatment of the life, death, resurrection of Jesus for the salvation of souls. Please check that out. The book drops, officially launches November 1st, which is just a couple of days from now. It will be on Audible, so for those of you who are non-readers, you can get this on your listening device. That should be excellent. All right, well, let's get back to Christian nationalism today. Uh, what I want to do is suggest that this term is going to be the subject of a definitional war, and there are three different definitions that you are likely to hear or hear about. Three different perspectives on this term, three different angles on this term, all trying to do something different with it. Let me give them to you first of all, and then I'm going to kind of comb through each one of these three definitions and examine it in favor of the third definition. That'll be the one that I'm arguing for. So the first definition we're going to look at is going to be called the progressivist definition of Christian nationalism. This would be the way that secular, leftist, progressive unbelievers want to frame up this term, primarily as a weapon to cajole and to shame those who would vote as Christians in a way that secular progressivists do not like. So that'll be my first definition. Then second of all, we're going to look at what I might call an amalgamated definition or a syncretistic definition of Christian nationalism. I am also uncomfortable with this ground as well. So we might think of these as being the two extremes, one on this side and the other on the other. And then third, I'm going to argue that there is a reasonable and charitable definition of a Christian nationalist, which I would be comfortable with that label properly so defined. So Let's get into these three definitions. First of all, the progressivist definition. Obviously, this is going to be a term that is going to be used primarily by the media and by the left to shame Christian voters. They want to ostracize as much as possible anybody who comes to the public forum, be it political or otherwise, with their Christian views entirely intact. Uh, there are those who would say that any engagement in civil politics whatsoever should be done so from a position of clear divorce. In other words, you ought not to think as a Christian when it comes to the state government, the local government, or the federal, federal government, or whatever other political entanglements that the United States may have more broadly and globally. So there would be some who want to try to disentangle any religious faith from the civic sphere entirely. And so what they're going to try to do here, it seems very obvious by now what the attempt is going to be to do, is to tie Christian nationalism 
with other terms which are obviously uh, uh, offensive and meant to be overtly politicized. So the term racist, the term bigot, the term colonialist, all of these terms have such a, a terrible and terrifying, horrific connotation to people that nobody wants to be identified as any one of those things. And like, you wouldn't want to touch the term racist with a 10-foot pole, right? In fact, in our society today, in our culture today, to be called a racist is one of the deepest insults that a person can possibly make about another. It is seen as being uh, a racist is the lowest of the low, one who has no moral integrity whatsoever. And so th this is why the word racist has become um, so overly used because they want to tie this connotation of shame and guilt and fear with the idea of being a, a racist so as um, to remove certain voices as much as possible. Same thing with a bigot, same thing with a colonialist. Now, I've done other videos on racism. I think that to call somebody a racist is one of the most serious things that you can ever call somebody because you're accusing them of violating the, the second greatest commandment. Greatest commandment, love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. Second greatest commandment, love your neighbor as yourself. When you're saying that somebody else is a racist, you're also implying that you know that person's heart and you can assert their, their sin overtly, which I think is a dangerous thing to do. Nevertheless, though, you're going to see a very concerted effort in the next few weeks and, of course, going into 2024 as well, to tie Christian nationalism with racism, bigotry, colonialism, etc., to the extent that nobody wants to be called a Christian nationalist because they don't want to be identified in those same categories. So you're going to see this from the media. You're going to see this from the left. You're going to see this from those who are uh, entirely secular in their worldview. Moreover, they're going to use fear mongering, um, stirring up terms like theocracy and things like that. We've already seen this with the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court makes this or that decision that leftists and secularists don't like. And so what they're going to do is they're going to fear monger and say, oh, look at this. It's, I guess it's a theocracy. Uh, like something coming out of the Islamic world or something like that. But, uh, but no, Christians need to be wiser than this. We need to see this tactic for what it is. Uh, people will accuse Christians who vote their conscience and vote their Bibles as those who are somehow violating the, uh, the unspoken church state um, differentiation. They're going to they're gonna accuse you of, of wandering into fields in which you are not welcome if you vote and speak and uh, engage as a true Christian. So primarily the leftist definition is going to be one that, that obviously tries to shame you away from being either Christian or nationalistic. And we're going to talk about the definition of a nationalist here in just a moment. We may think of politicians here, just by way of example, like President Biden or Nancy Pelosi, who claim on one hand to be practicing and devoted Catholics, and yet their politics are anything but in terms of their, their views on gender or sexuality or when life begins, the image of God. They say that they're Roman Catholic and that yet they do not bring any Christian influence whatsoever into their actual political maneuvers. And so I see this first category as being a very, very dangerous trend, again, primarily from the media, to shame and to cajole, ultimately with the hope of deplatforming anybody who has a primarily Christian worldview. So that's going to be the first definition of Christian nationalist. When you hear it, and you will hear it very, very often in the next few weeks, let that um, give you a check in the heart that you should be concerned with those who use that term that way because they're doing so from a manipulative and I think entirely unfair position so as to manipulate your participation. Okay, second of all, there would be what we might call a syncretistic definition of Christian nationalism, and I'm very uncomfortable with this as well. Anytime we try to amalgamate our Christianity with our civil politics to the extent that they become one and the same, that too can be very concerning. So imagine uh, you've got a bowl and you've got your, uh, <laughs> your cookie dough here and you've got your chocolate chips here and you're going to stir them together so that your Christianity is totally enmeshed with your national politics or your global politics. I think that that is actually a problem. This is easier for me to give examples 
than to define it. So I'm going to try to give you a couple examples of the kind of Christian nationalism that would make me very uncomfortable as a believer. So some churches have flags in their sanctuaries. I'm not comfortable with that. I think that's that kind of amalgamation that we should be careful to avoid. Whenever you bring the flag into the worship sanctuary itself, primarily if you put it up on the platform or in front near the pulpit, you are making some connections there, at least implicitly, that I don't think we should make. The flag is not an object of our religious worship. We are strictly monotheistic. We worship the one and true, the only living God. And we have to make very, very sure that um, our love for our nation does not actually become an object of our religious devotion. So what I say is put your flags outside the sanctuary or, or have them outside the church. I am in favor of American flags, no question about that. I just don't want them to ever be construed as part of our religious worship. So I prefer the symbolism of the flag to be outside the sanctuary so that when we come into the sanctuary, we pass by the flag as a reminder that we have freedom here, freedom to assemble and to worship. And when we go out of the sanctuary, I prefer to again be reminded that we're going out to do the work of the Great Commission, which is to bring the gospel to all tribes and nations and tongues and peoples. And our nation is one of those nations, so we should be bringing the gospel to the United States of America. So that would be an example of an amalgamation, which I wouldn't be comfortable with. So too, I would certainly not be comfortable with saying the Pledge of Allegiance right before we say the Lord's Prayer or something like that. I've even seen study Bibles that are branded as Patriot Bibles with American flags on them and things like that. Again, I'd be entirely uncomfortable with this. Probably the worst example of this, though, would be from churches. I think there's a church in Texas, if I'm not mistaken. I hope I'm not naming this person wrong. I think it's Robert Jeffries or something like that, who has routinely brought in political candidates to speak from the pulpit of the church. I think that's entirely inappropriate. I think it's an, it's an abandonment of our, our emphasis on the ordinary means of grace, the word and the sacrament ministry. I would never, ever, ever do something like that. In fact, the only reason I would ever even name a political candidate in the pulpit is when I'm praying for that person publicly or perhaps uh, rebuking one of their ungodly positions, which I do think is appropriate. So no candidates in the pulpit. There's also kind of a refusal to rebuke certain parties, and you probably can guess which parties those would be. Um, whenever our Christianity is so compromised that we cannot rebuke, criticize, even chastise one of or more of the political parties, that's that amalgamated, syncretistic kind of Christian nationalism that is entirely inappropriate for me. So I don't like the blending of any kinds of Americana symbols with the blending of our Christian faith. When we come to worship, we are here to do one thing. We are to worship the only true and the living God through his son, Jesus Christ, by the power of the Holy Spirit. And I don't want that blended with political overtones of any kind. So if that's what you mean by Christian nationalist, then I can clearly tell you that I am not in that second category. And I certainly am not going to be shamed by that first kind of definition of Christian nationalist. So that brings me then to my third definition of Christian nationalism. And I'm not sure what term to use here. I don't like to coin new terms that aren't already definitional. So, but, so for, the, for lack of any other term, I'm just going to call this a reasonable Christian nationalism. In other words, kind of a, a reasoned approach to what this concept might possibly mean. Now, the first thing that we observe about the term Christian nationalism is it's got two words, and both of those words have meaning. Christian, what does it mean to be Christian? It means that one has been savingly wrought upon by the Lord Jesus Christ through the power of the Holy Spirit such that he repents of his sins. Uh, he has now been given this new life, uh, this regenerative work of the Holy Spirit that causes him to now be in Christ. Okay, so we're talking about real, legitimate, experiential Christianity, the work, the saving work of God in the heart of a person. A Christianity is not a political demographic. It's not a voting block. It's not to be confused with how pollsters label evangelicals. A Christian is one who, um, who has one king, and that king is the Lord Jesus Christ. He is a sincere follower of Christ, and he honestly wants to do the Lord's will 
as it is revealed to us in Holy Scripture. So the term Christian means something. So also the term nationalist means something. Well, what, what does the word nationalist mean? Well, it would be in contradistinction on one hand to a globalist who would be trying to work for some kind of greater world order, uh, which would be larger than nationalism, or some kind of intersectionality, which would be lesser than a nation. So whenever you see people breaking up the nation into specific strands, let's say the LGBTQ movement, or let's say the overemphasis on racial divisions, trying to divide human beings by the color of their skin. Those would be lesser distinctions than the nation. I think both of those extremes would be problematic. So a nationalist is one who is not a globalist, nor is he one who is an intersectionalist who tries to divide people by their uh, external immutable characteristics like their race and their gender, etc. So a nationalist then, we might say, is somebody who simply wants their nation to thrive. And in that sense, nationalism is a very good thing. If you're going to be a citizen of this country, you should want the country to thrive and do its best. I mean, doesn't that make sense? So as I am an American citizen, I want the United States of America to do well. I want it to thrive in terms of its economy. I want it to thrive in terms of its morality. I want it to thrive in terms of its military potency in the case of defending our nation or in the cause of just war. And so just as I would expect a citizen of El Salvador to be a nationalist, to want their nation to do well, or just as I would want a Mexican citizen to cheer for their nation of Mexico or a, uh, a Francophone to cheer for their nation of France and want it to do well, or a Saxon to want the nation of Germany to do well, whatever nation a person is a part of, and especially the Christians they're in, they should want their own nation to do very well. And so, yes, we have no shame in saying that we hope for good things for the United States of America. What, what, are, we, what are we gonna cheer for our own downfall? That, that just doesn't seem reasonable to me. <laughs> so a Christian nationalist then is one who is devoted to the Lord Jesus Christ, but sincerely loves the neighbor and the neighbor being those in closest proximity, including the citizens of their own nation. And so they would want their nation then to thrive. I see absolutely nothing wrong with that. So what then would be the attributes and activities of a Christian nationalist rightly so defined? Well, of course, it would be one who prays for their magistrate. Now, magistrate is the term that the Westminster Confession of Faith uses to describe those persons who have civic and governmental responsibility. I'm thinking here of Westminster Confession of Faith, chapter 23 in particular. One of the things that we're told to do is to pray for our civil magistrate. And so a, a Christian nationalist, rightly so defined, would be one who prays for their governor or their senator or their representative or their president. That does not mean that we agree with them and everything, but that we pray that the Lord would use that person to lead us in the way that is most expedient, helpful, and good for our nation. I very commonly pray for uh, this current president as I very commonly prayed for the last president. They happen to be of two differing parties. Nevertheless, I do pray that they would know Christ and that they would follow Christ. I regularly pray for the conversion of those persons in civil governmental leadership responsibility that don't know Jesus as their savior. Not only that, but a true Christian nationalist, rightly so defined, would be one who votes their conscience and their Bible. Vote your conscience and your Bible. You have every right to vote your own conscience, just as every secular person has their right to vote their conscience as well. As Christians, of course, though, our consciences should be informed by Holy Scripture, which is why we are adamantly pro-life when it comes to positions related to abortion or euthanasia uh, or those who are handicapped or those who are of other races. We are adamantly pro-life. We love life. We believe in the doctrine of the imago Dei. And not only that, but we would hold to a biblical understanding of human gender and sexuality. There's absolutely no shame. Don't ever be shamed for voting your conscience and your Bible when you come to vote. I would even say this, that Christians should be the most active voting block that there is. If there are pollsters who want to do those kind of intersectional divisions to try to uh, typecast us into you know various subgroups, 
I would say Christians then should be though those persons who are most active voters because we recognize that there are eternal ramifications and significant spiritual consequences of elections. Okay. Moreover, we should also feel completely free to rebuke the magistrate whenever the magistrate does wrong. The church should be in a position to rebuke the magistrate. And when rebuked, the magistrate should listen and repent. Not only that, but I think that our constitution and our laws should be deeply informed by Holy Scripture, especially the New Testament and the moral law of the Old Testament. Now here, let me just splice a hair. In Reformed theology, make sure to check out the Westminster Confession of Faith chapter on the law. We do differentiate in the law between the moral law, the civil law, and the ceremonial law. So we believe that the civil law of the nation of Israel in the Old Testament as a theocracy and the ceremonial law as it relates to the worship in the tabernacle and the temple, that those have been abrogated by Christ. And so I would think it would be better for us to have our constitution and our laws deeply informed by New Testament morality as well as the moral law of the Old Testament. But that's why I'm uncomfortable with terms like theonomy or the federal vision. I would not use those terms to describe myself. Instead, what I would do is refer you to some of the, the papers that the Napark churches or the PCA have done on theonomy and the federal vision. I think those would be helpful to kind of clarify some of those things. Nevertheless, when we go into the voters booth, we should be voting our conscience and our Bible as it is informed by the New Testament and the moral law of the Old Testament. No question about that. Do I think the magistrate should be Christian? Yes, I do. I think that we should elect Christian magistrates to the positions of the most influence because, all things considered, they're going to come to their civic responsibilities with the most the most informed worldview when it comes to the things of the Lord. Um, I would be in favor of just war as it is best defined in the Westminster Confession of Faith. That is a difficult term to define, of course. And I would hold that the magistrate should never interfere with the goings-on of the church. Now, we saw a lot of that in the last pandemic. I was very uncomfortable with it. We see that in Canada. We saw that in the United States of America, too, when civil leaders were trying to tell the church when they could meet, where they could meet, how many people that they should have, what distance they should be when they come to their worship services. Look, the magistrate has no authority over the church and should not. If you find that there are certain people up for election that tried to control or to cudgel the church during the pandemic, vote those people out. Vote them into the history books. The state ex exists um, not only to protect its citizenry, but also to protect the freedoms of the church. All right, A Christian nationalist, rightly so defined, would be a very obedient person, one who respects the rule of law and is active at every level, active at the school board, active at the state, active at, at, at national levels as well. We should be those who are very concerned with rooting out ideological evil as it manifests itself in our particular nation, because we love our nation. Um, we should be those who are concerned to root out things like CRT, critical race theory, or the perversion agenda. We should be uh, very conscientious of those matters when it comes to our, our voting positions. And finally, let me just say this, when it comes to Christian nationalism, it is okay to be proud of your nation. Don't let anyone ever shame you for being proud of your nation. Don't ever let anyone shame you for being proud of being a Christian. Those two things are good things. It is good to be an American, just as it's good to be an El Salvador and a Mexican, a German, in, a, Ger a German or um, a French citizen. It is a good thing to be where you're from. People should be proud of their own background. They should be proud of their own nation. And when it comes to our history, we, like everybody else, acknowledge that our history is a mixed bag. Uh, we shouldn't be afraid to celebrate what has happened in the past, but we should also be so bold as to critique even our own people when they have erred, made mistakes, erred in the past as well. All right. If the third definition of what you mean of Christian nationalist is what you mean, 
then uh, count me among them, I suppose. All right, well, hey, thanks for checking into this video. Don't forget, Souls is coming out just in a couple of days. You can pre-order it on Amazon right now. The Audible edition will be coming out soon as well. Thanks for checking in. Do love you lots, and we'll talk to you later.